Welcome to another episode of the NEI Podcast. I'm Dr. Sabrina Siegel, live at the NEI Congress 2019. It's day four, and we are here with Dr. Cutler for an extended Q&A session. Let's listen in as he addresses your unanswered questions from today's presentation. This is Dr. Andrew Cutler, the new Chief Medical Officer of NEI, and I just finished giving a talk here at the 15th Annual NEI Congress called, I Blocked D2 and All I Got Was This Lousy Side Effect, What to Do When D2 Isn't Enough. And I had some terrific questions at the end. However, uh, fortunately, I ran out, of t- ran out of time. I wasn't able to answer all of the questions. So what I'd like to do now is take some time on this podcast to answer some of the remaining questions I didn't have time to get to. So let's just jump right in. The first question is, do you recommend adding pimavanserin to clozapine if the patient is not responding with positive symptoms? And my answer is, the data is, is suggestive that that would be a reasonable thing to do. So as a matter of fact, I would say, yes, that is a very reasonable option. Other reasonable options, of course, would be adding a more potent D2 blocker to clozapine. Uh, but I think that uh, adding pimavanserin based on the pilot data that I showed from Dr. Henry Nasralla suggests that that would be a very reasonable thing to try. And of course, the mechanism of that is that pimavanserin has very high affinity for the 5-HT2A receptor, where it's an antagonist. It also brings in a little bit of 5-HT2C antagonism, which might be helpful for the mood components. Next, does olanzapine and buprenorphine make sense? Well, it certainly does. The problem is you're talking about buprenorphine as a, is a mu opioid receptor agonist, which the problem there is we think might exacerbate the uh, weight gain possibility of olanzapine. So what you're trying to do here is be a mu receptor antagonist, which is what naltrexone and samudorfin do. However, I did mention that olanzapine and naltrexone was looked at and did not show much in the way of weight, weight mitigation, whereas samudorfin, which is a mu receptor antagonist as well as a kappa receptor antagonist, kappa opioid receptor antagonist, and that mechanism appears to be important because when you add samudorfin to olanzapine, Olanzapine, you do get mitigation of the weight gain and some of the metabolic consequences of olanzapine. So we're excited about that combination, which is known as ALKS3831. The company that makes it is Alchemies, and they are going to be submitting very soon to the FDA for approval. So it, it's about another year away before the FDA will, will probably rule on that. Can you please re-explain why dopamine 2 antagonists don't sufficiently improve negative symptoms? Certainly. So what happens here is if you're blocking D2, that's a good thing in the limbic system where we think there's too much dopamine activity causing the, uh, the positive symptoms of schizophrenia such as hallucinations and delusions. But by blocking D2, that actually blunts the patient. That that's blocking D2 is not a good thing in the limbic system as far as negative symptoms and especially in the nucleus accumbens which is motivation, reward, and pleasure. Now, as I did mention, there are no D2 receptors in the prefrontal cortex, so blocking D2 does not really affect the prefrontal cortex. So really what you're doing is dropping a wet blanket over the limbic system, and that's not going to improve negative symptoms. The problem with negative symptoms is there's too little dopamine activity in the prefrontal cortex. So again, blocking D2 doesn't really affect that. What we'd like to do is either increase D1 activity in the prefrontal cortex because the only dopamine receptor in the prefrontal cortex are D1, or indirectly increase dopamine going into the prefrontal cortex, and of course D2 blockade does not do that. Next, what are your thoughts on adding ECT to clozapine and cariprazine? I inherited such a patient. Well, that's, that's of course, the real world when th- things like this happen. Uh, there is no data, certainly. There are no studies on looking at this exact combination of things. But my answer is you have to do whatever works. Now, let's start first with the combination of clozapine and cariprazine. To me, this is a very rational combination. Clozapine has very little affinity for D2, whereas a cariprazine has high affinity for D2, where it acts as a partial agonist, functionally an antagonist, and also it has a 
activity at D3 is where it's a partial agonist has very high affinity for D3, and it's it's really the only commercially available medication that has high enough affinity for D3 to be clinically relevant. Now, uh, cariprazine also does not add to the potential weight gain and metabolic burden of clozapine, so it's actually a very rational thing to add to clozapine, both from an efficacy point of view and a safety and tolerability point of view. Now, there is some evidence that ECT in patients with schizophrenia can be helpful, particularly for mood and some of the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Uh, Although you have to be very, very careful because you're talking about patients who already have cognitive impairment, and we know that one of the side effects of ECT can be some cognitive impairment. So I certainly wish you the best of luck with this patient. This sounds like a very difficult to treat patient, which is, again, the real world. And I think what you're describing is something that, while it sounds excessive, is, is actually rational. Okay, next. I once saw an article regarding use of melatonin to prevent antipsychotic-induced weight gain. Have I heard of this? I have to be honest, I have not heard of that specifically, but we know that melatonin is involved with many uh, functions in the brain, and certainly uh, we believe that melatonin improves circadian rhythm in the sleep-wake cycle. There's some evidence of some antidepressant effects as well, and certainly it's, it's involved with, since it's regulating circadian rhythms, we know that getting better sleep helps fight weight gain and obesity. So people who are sleep deprived or don't get proper sleep, we know have more weight gain and obesity. So it could be along those lines, but I don't have any specific information on that. It's a great question. I've seen Brain HQ help with negative and cognitive symptoms and had lasting effects. Have you recommended any of these brain training programs to patients with schizophrenia? I can't say that I'm familiar with this particular uh, brain training program, but I think that it is a terrific idea. Uh, As I mentioned, there's various forms of cognitive remediation therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, which is essentially brain training, that have been shown to be effective. So I'm certainly open-minded, especially to the use of new technologies to helping uh, augment what we do with treating our patients, uh, such as those with schizophrenia. So I'm I'm certainly open-minded to uh, brain training programs and especially to anything that the patient can do online or on on their computer. Um, Sometimes our patients do better with interventions like this, and they have certainly because of the negative symptoms, they might have trouble with uh, interpersonal interactions. So I think it's it's very fascinating. I'd love to know more about it myself, and hopefully there'll be some research and data on this. Buspirone has some very weak D2 antagonism, was initially studied at 2,400 milligrams as an antipsychotic before the the development program pivoted to anxiety. Now, that's fascinating. I did not know that. I always think of buspirone as a uh, potent 5... Uh, sorry, not a potent, but as a 5-HT1A partial agonist. Um, it's not totally surprising to me because I'm aware that in Japan there's a medication called Tandospirone, which is a cousin of buspirone that is approved for anxiety. And lorazidone, which we know is a very effective antipsychotic, is actually derived from Tandospirone. So the spirones may in fact have some uh, D2 antagonism as part of their profile. So I thank, uh, thank the person for, uh, for that information. Uh, I have a very interesting and important question. How do I like being the CMO of NEI? Well, I love it, is the short answer. Basically, uh, this is a newer uh, position that I've, I've taken over starting October 9th. So today, as I'm speaking to you, is November 10th. So it's really only been about a month now. And I can tell you that being here at the NEI Congress, I, I feel like I'm uh, certainly earning my stripes to some degree. I've been involved with a lot of different aspects of what we do, and I look forward to doing even more, to contributing to content and strategy, to helping with our faculty interactions and our faculty training, and also to interacting with our members and helping in any way I can. My goal is to help continue the positive growth of NEI to help make us bigger, and mostly Im- importantly, even better as we try to continue to serve the mission of NEI, which is to be very learner and participant focused and to be a valuable resource to people in the mental health field who are actually out there on the front lines treating clinicians. My personal uh, ex- uh, expertise, of course, since I've been a researcher, is in bringing uh, newer information and helping translate it for clinicians into their world. Okay, now what is the potential value of some of these newer emerging drugs that we've been talking about in treating bipolar spectrum disorders? Well, there's very large value, I would say. Certainly, uh, when I was talking about uh, lumateparone, 
is one such medication. And then the uh, ALK-3831, the olanzapine semidorfan combination, we know that olanzapine is effective and is approved for various stages of bipolar disorder. Uh, the TAR-1 agonist that I talked about, the synovian medication it has some there's some evidence that tar1 agonism is also beneficial for depression and mood states and the thinking would be that since we're not increasing monoamines uh, it's not a reuptake inhibitor that we would have much less liability to uh, exacerbate or cause mania now the lumateparone drug I'm going to go back to, which is uh, intracellular therapies, is the company, and that medication has an, an FDA PDUFA date. That's the date that the FDA rules on the approval of December 27th. So in very short time, we're going to know if that medication is going to be approved or not. And so far, the uh, feedback has been positive. But this is a medication that has a very complex and interesting uh, series of mechanisms of actions that actually predict antidepressant and mood stabilizing properties. So I predict that it would be effective. And I know the company has been studying the drug for bipolar depression, and they do have a positive study already for bipolar depression. So I'm really excited about these newer emerging medications, not only for schizophrenia, but for mood disorders, including a bipolar disorder. We've certainly learned that a lot of our atypical antipsychotics do have efficacy for mood disorders, whether bipolar or for augmentation for major depression. Can you comment on cariprazine for negative symptoms? I certainly can, and that's actually one of the most exciting studies that I've seen in the past few years, which is cariprazine was studied in a European study, in a very, very well-designed study by Wolfgang Fleischhocker and colleagues. And this was published in The Lancet a couple of years ago. This was a study of cariprazine versus risperidone for negative symptoms for schizophrenia. Not only did cariprazine work for negative symptoms, it was clearly superior to risperidone for treating negative symptoms. That's one of the few studies we have of one antipsychotic clearly being better than another one for any aspect of schizophrenia. And so I think that this is probably related to the unique D3 mechanism that we've talked about. This drug is the only drug that has high enough affinity for the D3 receptor to compete with dopamine. And especially if you are a partial agonist or an antagonist at D3, what happens is you are blocking the presynaptic presynaptic D3 autoreceptor in the ventral tegmental area, and you increase dopamine release in the mesocortical circuit, and as well as the mesolimbic circuit. So you're increasing dopamine into the prefrontal cortex, and what that does is it seems to improve negative symptoms, also cognition and mood, and that may be underlying some of the antidepressant effects of cariprazine. Okay, um, minocycline for schizophrenia, I have seen benefits. Well, minocycline is fascinating. It's, of course, an antibiotic, but it also has significant anti-inflammatory properties. There is a literature of minocycline being used for depression, and there's also a literature on minocycline for schizophrenia, particularly cognition in schizophrenia. And I don't have any personal experience with it, but I am certainly open to the possibility. The problem with minocycline is there are some side effects and some risks, including uh, discoloration of the teeth. So it is something that I would probably reserve for later uh, later along in my algorithm. It's not something I would do early on at this stage. Certainly more research is needed. And one of the things that is very interesting, my friend Roger McIntyre was talking at our pre-conference about the gut biome. And what he was talking about was that minocycline has been shown to have anti-inflammatory effects, and it could be through its antibiotic effects on some of the bad bacteria that could collect in our guts. And so this leads to the possibility that there might be other antibiotics that are anti-inflammatory, and that also might be able to uh, get rid of some of the the bad, if you will, uh, bugs and bacteria in our gut, and that would leave more of the positive uh, bacteria in our gut, and that might have positive beneficial effects on mood, cognition, and brain function in general. Has exercise been studied to increase cognitive function in patients with schizophrenia? And would combining that with CRT increase the effectiveness due to BDNF enhancing cognition? The answer is a resounding yes, an exclamation point yes. There is no question that exercise improves cognition in all people, whether that's people who don't have mental illness. Certainly the literature is best for those with depression, but also in those with schizophrenia. 
And so uh, combining it with CRT is extremely reasonable. As I mentioned in my talk, CRT does have beneficial effects on blood flow uh, and function in the prefrontal cortex and in parts of the brain that have to do with cognition. And uh, we know that exercise increases growth factors, including BDNF. It also has anti-inflammatory effects. All right. Uh, when will pimavanserin be FDA indicated for psychosis not related to Parkinson's disease? Excellent question. Uh, pimavanserin has recently uh, been shown to be very efficacious in treating psychosis related to dementia in general. So a very large clinical trial was done not ju- looking at pimavanserin for psychosis, not just secondary to Alzheimer's dementia, but the FDA actually requested that the company study it in dementia in general, all forms of dementia. So in this trial, the vast majority of patients, uh, p- perhaps two-thirds, uh, did have Alzheimer's dementia, but another significant chunk uh, had vascular dementias, and there were some that had Parkinson's disease dementia. So the drug is already approved for Parkinson's d- disease psychosis with or without dementia. Dementia, but it was studied here specifically in those who had Parkinson's dementia. And then there was a group that also had uh, Lewy body dementia or, and frontotemporal dementia. And as I said, the drug was extremely effective in decreasing psychotic symptoms in this group of patients with uh, dementias. Uh, the, so that, that uh, data was just recently released. What tends to happen now is the data has to be uh, collected and further analyzed and then compiled and sent into the FDA with uh, a request for approval. And typically that takes another year or so. So I would anticipate within a year or so we might get approval, of PIMA, another approval of pimivanserin now for psychosis secondary to dementia in addition to its current approval for Parkinson's disease psychosis. Okay, well, uh, that wraps up the uh, extended question session. I want to thank everyone for all their terrific questions. I want to thank you, too, for listening to this podcast and for your involvement with the Neuroscience Education Institute. For more information, you can go to our website, www.neiglobal.com. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned for the next extended Q&A sessions from NEI Congress 2019. And make sure to subscribe.